So, so far we talked about um, more crystalline structures. Uh, if you're looking at polymers, uh, which are more the plasticky uh, types of solids, they don't conform to PCC, FCC, and HCP structures as we saw before. Uh, they have a very amorphous structures. And I kind of want to discuss them a little bit and give you a bit of an introduction to what polymers are and what they, how they behave. Uh, so we mentioned it briefly in class that polymers are repeat units. If you just take an, uh, a molecule or something like that, then you just have a bunch of molecules that are the same, hold hands. You have uh, a polymer structure. So you can, you can see like a, a, a small little visual, visualization of it here. Uh, and sorry, we move this out of the way. Uh, so the, uh, there are se several ways by which we can construct polymers. Uh, the simplest one is if I have a repeat unit and it just repeats and repeats, repeats, repeats like this. X is holding hands with X and it goes on forever. Those are linear polymers. You can have polymer chains that kind of look like this and then they branch off and it's known as a nonlinear polymer. You can have two types of molecules hold hands and they alternate and it'll be A, B, A, B, A, B, something like that. If they perfectly alternate, uh, we call this alternating copolymer. Uh, if it just does it randomly, we'll call it random copolymer. Uh, if I have a bunch of A's hold on, uh, hold hands together, and then they hold hands hands with another poly another chain that's a bunch of B's, and another chain that's a bunch of C's, we call that di-block or tri-block copolymers. Okay, those are just some terminologies you may see eventually. Kind of wanted to give you an idea of what that looks like if you ever hear anyone say it. Okay. The other two things uh, that we can classify polymers as thermoset and thermoplastic. Okay, and all that means is that some plastics, if you heat them up, they harden uh, irreversibly. You cannot make them not harden anymore. Okay, uh, and uh, I suppose a really good example of that would be egg whites. Uh, those are biopolymers. Uh, at first, if you uh, have them hang out, that they're, they're still they're a polymer, they're long chains of amino acids. If you heat them up, the, uh, the molecule, sorry, the chains that make up the polymers, they, they start um, forming bonds, these red things, what we call cross-linking. And this cross-linking is a chemical bond and it ends up forming um, a hard structure, like the egg white, that cannot be undone unless you break the bond, which is really hard to do. So. This is known as cross-linking, so we say that that's a thermoset polymer. Uh, there's a bunch of those around. And thermoplastic, uh, those are things that if you heat them up uh, and you can cool them back down, um, you, can, you, can, you can melt them, you can uh, harden them, melt them, harden them, you know, as you wish, just, just like a regular liquid going to a regular solid, like any of the other things that you know, like ice going to water uh, and, and vice versa. So those are thermoplastic. They, they do have a reversible uh, way to melt and freeze. Uh, so a, a cool example for cross-linking um, that I'll share with you that I uh, had heard before uh, was that tires uh, used to have, uh, used to be made of rubber and rubber is a thermoplastic. And what the problem with that was, uh, was that, um, over time, if you were not using your car over, uh, for, for, you know, overnight or whatever it is, uh, the weight of the car would actually make the, the rubber deform. Uh, and so you would not have a, a circular tire in the morning. And you'd have to drive a little bit for it to get some heat and it would melt it some and it would uh, then conform to a circular shape. Uh, and that would happen every day. And that's obviously annoying. So what they did was they uh, added sulfur chains to uh, rubber in a process known as vulcanization, and they vulcanized the rubber. And so what they mean is that what that means is that they made the rubber from a thermoplastic polymer into a thermal set. So now uh, when you heat it up, it, it 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 is set as that structure. So uh, our tires these days are thankfully set in that shape. Okay, you could look at. Um, Phase diagrams for thermoplastics uh, or the ones that reversibly melt. And you can see that if I'm looking at, say, ice forming water, um, it has a sharp point at which that happens, say zero degrees Celsius. That's it. 
If you're looking at a polymer though, uh, you're not gonna have that sharp uh, transition. Uh, you, you're gonna have uh, uh, it taking over some time. And we call this transition, the glass transition temperature, and it's it got a range. It's, it's an actual range. Um, and we call uh, a solid polymer a glass, a liquid polymer a melt, and anywhere in between is known as a rubber or rubbery, okay? Somewhere that's got both, um, both involved together, okay? Let's, let's like now talk about molecular weights of polymers and how we may calculate the molecular weights of a polymer. Because polymers have a bunch of different chains. Uh, so if I told you NH3, for example, ammonia, you know ammonia, it looks like NH3, it's got one N, three Hs. If I told you um, polyethylene, you don't really know what polyethylene looks like. It could be very long, it could be very short. It doesn't really matter what it is if I on your beginning. As long as it has repeatable units, say like this, it have 10 units, 100 units, 1,000 units. It doesn't matter, they're all polyethylene. So um, different polyethylenes can have different molecular weights and that's true for a bunch of plastics. PVC could have different weights. And it tends to be that the shorter weights have uh, uh, more liquid-like structures. The longer weights have more solid-like structures. And so understanding how to calculate the molecular weight of a polymer sample is kind of important because what you need to know is it's always gonna be a mixture of short ones and long ones. You cannot, uh, by any stretch, purify a polymer so all of them have the same molecular weight. That is an impossibility. So suppose I gave you this very simple distribution of molecular weights of this polymer. Okay, so I drew this, some of them are longer, some of them are much longer. And I want to know the molecular weight of the sample. How do I do that? Well, let me switch over to my sheet of paper here. I can do it in two ways. So I have, so just to remind you here, I have uh, uh, number and, and weight. So I know that I have one, um, one chain that's 30, two chains that are 40, and one chain that is 50. Okay, so let me propose two ways to do it. I could say, I could take the total weight and divide it by the total number of, of chains or atoms, why not? So that would mean that, um, well, I have 30, I have 80, and I have 50, right? So 30 plus 80 plus 50, it's like, um, that will give me the total weight that I have involved here. And I divide that by one, two, three, four. So what's this, uh, 80, 160, so this ends up being 40. So the molecular weight according to this would be 40 grams per mole. Okay, that makes sense. So 40 is one way of thinking about it. This is known as number average. I'm considering them all to be num numbered. Um, they're all numerically the same. I'm just looking at the total number of chains. But there's another way I could look at it. I could say that this sample here uh, weighs 30 grams. Let's say grams more, right? And I also know that my entire sample here is 30 plus 80 plus 50, right? So what that means is I have this thing is 30 over 160. That's the mass fraction. That's the fraction of number one, okay? For number two, um, it will be a half. It will be, well, I have two of them, so it'll be 80 grams divided by 30 plus 80 plus 50. So that gives me uh, one half. So that goes here. Um, and then I also know that this one will probably be the, 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 not the definitely be the, the difference. So it will be 50 divided by 30 plus 80 plus 50. Uh, and that should give me the rest. Uh, that will be 50 over 160. So now I have the ratios, the mass fraction. So the fraction of my sample that is chain number one by mass is this. 
but chain number two is this, and chain number three is this. So now I can calculate my molecular weight um, a little bit differently. I could say that, um, well, if this is my fraction, right, I could say that 30 over 160 of my sample weighs 30. I could say half of my sample weighs 40. And I could say that 50 over 160 of my sample weighs 50. And I can add them all up. And when I do that, I didn't pre-do that. So I gotta do that now, quick. So I have, Okay, I'm just putting it all to the calculator, and I get that this is 41.25 grams per mole. Just when you add them up. So you see that the method above, which I think you can follow, that's just the total weight divided by the total number of chains, gives me 40. The method below, which I think you can follow as well, the a, a fraction of this is um, a fraction of my sample is this, another fraction is this, another fraction of that. I'll use the fractions, the weighted average, to get 41.25. So my question is, well, which one do I take? Which one is the correct one? And uh, the short of it is, well, both. So what I showed you, the first, the first thing, the first thing that I showed you is known as the number average molecular weight. So you take the total mass of the polymers and divide by the, by the number of polymers of the polymer molecules. Okay, like I showed you, like the first example. The weight average uh, is you take the mass fraction of, your, of each sample and you multiply it by the mass in that sample and you divide by the total, the total mass and you get the, the weight average, which I just showed you. It's just a weighted average. And these two numbers will always be different. And we can quantify them uh, with this thing called the polydispersity index by dividing them. And this is a number that's always gonna be bigger than one. Um, and when it is actually equal to one, that means that my sample is pure and has only one um, length. So over here, they would all be uh, of this length, for example. So that's something that would never happen. So a polydispersity of one means that it's a very pure sample, uh, which never is never gonna happen. So when you purchase a polymer ever, you want to buy something that's got a low polydispersity index because that would mean that it has more predictable structures uh, and properties.